Hare Krishna, everyone. This is Achyuta Baba from Nightlight Astrology, and today I'm going to share with you the story of the Elephant Lord Gajendra. Now, this is one of my favorite stories from the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is one of the core sacred texts of Bhakti Yoga. Um, there's a few insights that I've been thinking about lately um, from this story um, that have been uh, helpful for me to remember right now during this time of global pandemic, and so I thought you might be inspired to hear about them as well. Um, I should say from the beginning that I'm uh, a neophyte and that many um, really great, you know, saintly sages have written commentaries about this story. Um, and it is a, a very rich and there are many points that can be gained from this, uh, this story in the Bhagavatam. So I'm just scratching the surface today, but hopefully a few thoughts that you might appreciate. And the story itself is just really, really beautiful. So um, the story and prayers of Lord Gajendra, the elephant, appear in the eighth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam in the second chapter, and they carry a lot of important lessons about bhakti yoga, and again, some that I think are really applicable for us right now. So I'm going to go ahead and read it to you, uh, just the first part of it. <clears throat> so chapter two is called The Elephant Gajendra's Crisis, um, and this story is being told to a king who finds out that he has about a week left to live. And so he's like, well what can I do with a week left? And he sits down with a sage and the sage uh, basically helps him to learn everything that he can about bhakti yoga in the last week of his life. So Shukadev Goswami, the sage said to the king, my dear king, there's a very large mountain called Trikutu. Trikuta. It is 10,000 yojanas high. Being surrounded by the ocean of milk, it is very beautifully situated. The length and breadth of the mountain are of the same measurement, 80,000 miles. Its three principal peaks, which are made of iron, silver, and gold, beautify all directions and the sky. The mountain also has other peaks, which are full of jewels and minerals and are decorated with nice trees, creepers, and shrubs. The sounds of the waterfalls on the mountain create a pleasing vibration. In this way, the mountain stands, increasing the beauty of all directions. The ground at the foot of the mountain is always washed by waves of milk that produce emeralds all around in the eight directions, north, south, east, west, and the directions midway between them. The inhabitants of the higher planets, the Siddhas, Charanas, Gandharvas, Vidyaharas, Serpents, Kinaras, and Apsharas, go to that mountain to sport. Thus all the caves of the mountain are full of these denizens of the heavenly planets. Because of the resounding vibrations of the denizens of heaven singing in the caves, the lions there, being very proud of their strength, roar with unbearable envy, thinking that another lion is roaring in that way. The valleys beneath Trikuta Mountain are beautifully decorated by many varieties of jungle animals, and in the trees which are maintained in gardens by the demigods, varieties of birds chirp with sweet voices. Trikuta Mountain has many lakes and rivers, with beaches covered by small gems resembling grains of sand. The water is as clear as crystal, and when the demigod damsels bathe in it, their bodies lend fragrance to the water and the breeze, thus enriching the atmosphere. In a valley of Trikuta Mountain, there was a garden called Rutamat. This garden belonged to the great devotee Varuna and was a sporting place for the damsels of the demigods. Flowers and fruits grew there in all seasons. <clears throat> in that garden, there was a very large lake filled with shining golden lotus flowers and the flowers known as Kamudha which added excellent beauty to the mountain. Intoxicated bumblebees drank honey and hummed with the chirping of the birds, whose songs were very melodious. The lake was crowded with swans, cranes, and flocks of water chickens and other murmuring birds. Because of the agitating movements of the fish and tortoises, the water was decorated with pollen that had fallen from the lotus flowers. The lake was surrounded by kadamba flowers. The banks were also abundantly adorned with the varieties of trees that yielded flowers and fruits in all seasons. Thus, the entire mountain stood gloriously decorated. The leader of the elephants, who lived in the forest of the mountain, Trakuta, once wandered toward the lake with his female elephants. He broke many plants, creepers, thickets, and trees, not caring for their piercing thorns. Simply by catching scent of that elephant, all other elephants, the tigers, and the other ferocious animals, such as lions, rhinoceroses, great serpents, and black and white sarabhas, fled in fear. The chamari deer also fled. By the mercy of this elephant, animals like the foxes, wolves, buffaloes, bears, boars, porcupines, monkeys, rabbits, the other deer, and many other small animals loitered elsewhere in the forest. They were not afraid of him. Surrounded by the herds, other elephants, including females and followed by the young ones, Gajapati, the leader of the elephants, made Trakuta Mountain tremble all around because of the weight of his body. 
He was perspiring, liquor dripped from his mouth, and his vision was overwhelmed by intoxication. He was being served by bumblebees who drank honey, and from a distance he could smell the dust of the lotus flowers, which was carried from the lake by the breeze. Thus surrounded by his associates who were afflicted by thirst, he soon arrived at the bank of the lake. The king of the elephants entered the lake, bathed thoroughly, and was relieved of his fatigue. Then, with the aid of his trunk, he drank the cold, clear, nectarian water, which was mixed with the dust of lotus flowers and water lilies, until he was finally satisfied. Like a human being who lacks spiritual knowledge and is too attached to his family, the elephant, being illusioned by the external energy of Krishna, had his wives and children bathe and drink the water. Indeed, he raised water from the lake with his trunk and sprayed it over them. He did not mind the hard labor involved in this endeavor. By the arrangement of providence, O king, a strong crocodile was angry at the elephant and attacked the elephant's leg in the water. The elephant was certainly strong, and he tried his best to get free from this danger sent by providence. Thereafter, seeing Gajendra in that grave condition, his wives felt very, very sorry and began to cry. The other elephants wanted to help Gajendra, but because of the crocodile's great strength, they could not rescue him by grasping him from behind. O king, the elephant and the crocodile fought in this way, pulling one another in and out of the water for 1,000 years. Upon seeing the fight, the demigods were very surprised. Thereafter, because of being pulled into the water and fighting for many long years, the elephant became diminished in his mental, physical, and sensual strength. The crocodile, on the contrary, being an animal of the water, increased in enthusiasm, physical strength, and sensual power. When the king of the elephants saw that he was under the clutches of the crocodile by the will of providence, and being embodied and circumstantially helpless could not save himself from danger, he was extremely afraid of being killed. He consequently thought for a long time and finally reached the following decision. The other elephants who were my friends and relatives could not rescue me for this from this danger. But then to speak of my wives, they cannot do anything. It is by the will of providence that I have been attacked by this crocodile, and therefore I shall seek shelter of the supreme personality of Godhead, who is always the shelter of everyone, even, greatest, even the greatest personalities. The supreme personality of Godhead is certainly not known to everyone, but he's very powerful and influential. Therefore, Although the serpent of eternal time, which is fearful in force, endlessly chases everyone ready to swallow him, if one who fears the serpent seeks shelter of the Lord, the Lord gives him protection, for even death runs away in fear of the Lord. I therefore surrender unto him the great and powerful supreme authority, who is the actual shelter of everyone. So what an absolutely beautiful story, first of all. Um, it's a story that has always stuck with me since the very first time that I read it. And I, I come back to it often. Um, there's a few takeaways that have been on my mind lately that I want to share with you um, that I think are applicable, especially given just what we're all going through right now with the coronavirus um, sort of sweeping the world. Um, so the first takeaway from this story about Lord Gajendra is pretty simple. Here's an elephant who's very powerful. He's a king. He's got it all. And he's basically living in heaven. Um, but he, that picture is interrupted by a crocodile who grabs his leg and he realizes, I'm screwed. All this is going to end. Now what do I do? Which is actually a mirror of where the story of the Bhagavatam began. With a king who uh, is uh, sort of um, cursed, to, has about seven days left to live. And he's like, well, I'm out of time. Um, all my power and everything is about to go. I better get serious about spiritual life. What do I do? And then he sits down with the sage Shukadev Goswami and uh, King Parikshit gets a, a massive bhakti yoga download um, as he's preparing to, to die because of a curse. So this story is a sort of mirror image of that story. Um, in a literary sense, it's um, interesting the way in which the sage is telling the king the story to, to in, a, in a way, help him understand the situation that he's in. But actually, we're all like that because we all have very limited time here on planet Earth. And most of us, um, you know, uh, oftentimes I, I experience this myself where I'm like, I don't, I don't need to take to spiritual life or I don't need to um, be very serious about my relationship with God because, you know, I'm fine. Things are fine. Things are pretty, things are actually kind of beautiful here. It's good. It's good. I'm fine. Right? Like that. And it's true that there's great beauty here. I mean, that description of the heavenly planet where Lord Gajendra is hanging out sounded awesome. Like I would love to take a vacation 
<laughs> right now versus being on home quarantine. Uh, but at any rate, the highlight of the story is really simple. No matter how powerful we are, how satisfied we feel, how heavenly the situation in the material world, um, it will eventually end and we'll, we will experience pain and suffering, death, old age, disease. Um, we can't ever eliminate these things fully. And in some ways, the more deeply absorbed we get into the temporary um, uh, sort of pleasures of the material world, the more that it really feels like a rude awakening when the crocodile grabs our leg. And the crocodile is, of course, emblematic, as Lord Gajendra says in his own prayer at the end of the chapter, of the serpent of time, uh, impermanence. And um, Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita says, time I am the great destroyer. So uh, this is uh, this picture of Lord Gajendra is really emblematic in many ways of all of us and our egos in the material world. Like, I'm fine here. I've got this. Everything is actually good, you know, uh, and we're very confident that th things will go on just being fine. But then eventually something always comes. And right now, in a sense, on the collective, it feels to me like, you know, the crocodile has just bit the elephant. That great heavenly world of material comforts and of wealth and the marketplaces and life as we know it, the normal flow of life has been interrupted. It's as though the crocodile has bit our leg, you know, on the collective level. But what does Lord Gajendra do that's so important is at the end, he realizes the situation. He realizes there is something bigger than me. This is impermanent. This cannot last. I cannot win. I, I'm this something, something stronger. And so I surrender. I surrender my heart to uh, the divinity, to God, to Krishna, of which I am a part. So um, that's, that's really uh, a great teaching for us. There's a verse from the Bhagavad Gita that I really like, where Krishna talks about the, the reasons that people tend to start reaching out for God and start taking to spiritual life. And Krishna says, O oh, best among the Bharatas, four kinds of pious men begin to render devotional service unto me, the distressed, the desire of wealth, the inquisitive, and he who is searching for knowledge of the absolute. Let's break those down one at a time. The distressed. Well, there it is again. When do we tend to take, you know, again, consider the move to spiritual life to be very important? Or when do we call out to God and say, I need help. I surrender. Let me uh, learn to be a part of you. Let me learn to be cognizant of the divinity that I am, that I'm a part of with you. Let me learn to serve you and love you. We tend to do that when we're freaked out, when the paradise garden scene has gotten um, interrupted or our, um, our temporary sense of being in control has been overpowered by something. So he says the distress, that's the first one that, that tend to people that tend to call out the distressed. Second, he says the desire of wealth we also tend to call out when we want something selfishly, um, whether it's wealth or anything else, like give me this, give me this, like God is a, a, like a, a slot machine or something. Um, we also then tend to call out inquisitively when we want to know something. Why is this this way? Why, you know, so we, we don't understand something. We want to know why, and we call out. And then the highest one that Krishna mentions is that, that person that is searching for knowledge of the absolute. Who am I? Where do I come from? Who is God? What is my relationship with God? Um, what is truth? What is beauty? What is love? What is divinity? You know, these, the, the searching for the absolute, for the highest. And he says of, those, of these people, the one who is in knowledge, who is always engaged in pure devotional service, that means you could say also pure devotional service, meaning just dedicating one's life to God, to loving God, to serving others because we see God in everything and everyone. For I am very dear to him and he is very dear to me. That, that person who seeks knowledge, the absolute, is always engaged in pure devotional service is the best. The relationship becomes very personal. And the other ones, I'm a question answerer, you know, so to speak. I'm a, I'm an, I'm a wish fulfiller or I'm someone who is helping the distressed. And those are all, I mean, God doesn't in this verse, Krishna is not saying, yeah, those idiots. No, you know, I, I help the distressed. I help people with their desires. I help people answer questions. But the one that really has it figured out is the one seeking knowledge of their true nature and of me and the one who ends up loving me and asking, how can I serve you? Um, that, that one is very, very, that kind of person is very dear to me and I'm very dear to, to that kind of person. Um, 
So when I think about that and I go back to Gajendra's prayers, one of the things that I'm reminded of is, you know, in some ways the story is, the moral of the story is don't wait until the crocodiles got your leg. Um, the good news here is that Krishna doesn't, you know, isn't like too late. He comes swooping down on Garuda, chops off the head of the crocodile and um, <clears throat> helps Gajendra out. Gajendra becomes enlightened, achieves a spiritual body. It, even the crocodile is enlightened by virtue of having his head cut off. The crocodile, who was a, a sage that had been cursed in a previous, uh, well, kind of like a heavenly being that had been uh, a Gandharva, if I remember correctly, who had been cursed in a previous lifetime. Uh, for messing around with a sage, he had pissed the sage off. Don't don't do that, you know. And he had gotten cursed, and um, this uh, the sage had gotten cursed uh, had cursed him to become a crocodile in his next lifetime. Um, and then, it, although he became a crocodile, and he he's the one who bites Lord Gajendra's leg. When Krishna comes down and kills him, the death blow of Krishna also delivers him. Uh, the the crocodile is uh, delivered as a result of being killed. It's a, a lot of times, one of the things I love about the Bhakti scriptures is that many of the beings who appear to be like enemies or bad guys, in, they, they have a plot or a role to play in these stories. And oftentimes, even though they end up getting wasted, you know, they, they're, in, in getting wasted, they end up be, becoming um, you know, enlightened. They, they end up becoming um, spiritually uh, liberated. So at any rate, um, and, and, you know, the other thing, the, the main takeaway that I have from this is that Gajendra's sincerity at the end is what matters. E even though he waited to the last minute and the moral of the story is in some ways don't wait until the last minute. The other truth here is when we sincerely call out, when we sincerely surrender and recognize, you know what, I'm not in control. Uh, the, the things that I try to cling to in the illusion of being separate or apart from God um, are only temporary. They will eventually end. And, um, you know, when we recognize that and call out sincerely to take shelter as Lord Gajendra does, um, then, you know, uh, Krishna definitely reciprocates. God, God comes in and says, I've got you. You're fine. Spiritually speaking, you know, we may still have to deal with difficulties in the material world, but that where does that beginning of spiritual uh, rebirth, healing, and, you know, e e eternality, love uh, and eventually liberation where does that come from it comes from continuing in the dire moments in the in the times when our power our 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 prosperity or our sense of um temporary security is rudely often taken away and we we say okay i get it but then the task is also the moral of the story is also but do it every day every day we're actually in lord gajendra's position we're in the water right now Crocodile is there. We just don't see it yet. That's not to be fearful. It's just a truth. You know, eventually we're all going to die. And whatever we think right now is if I'm fixed up because I've got this or that surrounding me in my material situation. Um, eventually those things will be pulled. And if we haven't cultivated the soul, if we haven't tended to the soul and its relationship with our divine source, um, it can be a very, very terrifying experience. Um, Again, uh, you know, something that I've said before is that in some ways, um, bhakti yoga is, as far as, you know, my own realization goes, um, bhakti yoga is really the practice of being like, hey, I'm Gajendra right now. I'm in the water right now. And I tend to think that everything is 100% fine. But eventually, you know, coronavirus has come and they can knock out the entire world economy, you know, really like, like quickly. Um, so, if we recognize this rather than being lulled to sleep by the uh, paradise <laughs> setting, you know, um, then we're in good shape, but it takes practice to do that. So one of the series that I'm going to be starting that's coming up with are easy ways to surrender daily. Um, the series that I'm going to be doing is, is uh, basic practices that you can do to be in surrender daily. It's like Lord Gajendra lifts up the flower to Krishna and says, I surrender, I get it. But we have to do that every single day so that we don't get caught in that situation of um, waiting to surrender until the crocodile has our leg. So chanting is one of the easiest ways to surrender daily. 
and I will be doing um, a series of videos, as I said, called Easiest Ways to Surrender Daily, and uh, chanting is at the top of the list. So I hope that you'll stay tuned for that video so that you can learn how to chant. Um, it is a very basic and beautiful way to call out to God every day to, um, to start talking to Krishna and um, to um, start cultivating that mood of surrender. I'm a soul surrendered to you. I am one of your servants. You know, teach me how to love and serve others uh, like that. And it, it's uh, very easy ways that we can learn that. So I'm excited to share a little bit more uh, about that. And I hope that you've enjoyed the story of Lord Gajendra. Um, I would very much like to hear your reflections in the comment section. Uh, tell me what reflections came up for you as you're hearing the story of Lord Gajendra. Um, and what are the ways that you try to surrender daily? I'd love to hear your thoughts about that too. I know some of you probably already have ways that you try to uh, surrender every day so that we don't get um, you know, too caught up. So tell me about those two. I'd love to hear from you. All right, take it easy until next time. Hare Krishna.